Good morning, church. We welcome all of you to our Sunday morning worship service and also our online viewers. Um, this morning, I want to just continue with the series on weapons of our warfare. And this is the last weapon that we are going to do this morning. It's the weapon of the Holy Spirit. The weapon of the Holy Spirit is a very powerful weapon. And it is called a secret weapon. I'll let you know why it's called a secret weapon later on. As you know that, you know, I just want to recall what I spoke the last time. You know that there's a spiritual battle going around in the spiritual realm every day of our lives. And the battle is between the angelic forces and the demonic forces that we can't see. But it's visible in the physical realm through the manifestation of what is happening in our everyday lives as we battle. But the, the, the war or the battle is happening in the spiritual realm. Amen. Hallelujah. And so the, the, the devil, he, the, the thief or the Satan is a destroyer. He just comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. Huh? So he, the Bible says here in um, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, it says that our struggle, Paul says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That means we are not, you know, uh, when, we are in a, uh, when, we are, when we face problems, it is not about this church or that church when we are having some battle between our relatives or our spouses, or, you know, we are having some arguments or some, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, arguments and, uh, and some problems that we face, financial problems or whatever problems that come in into our lives. You see, we, 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 we don't always uh, fight against that in flesh and blood. Because our warfare, he says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it is against the principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness, and the uh, spirits in high places. So here, he, uh, he's saying in Ephesians 6 and 12, he says that the principalities, the powers, the rulers, you know, the, you know Satan has his own army. He has a hierarchy. He himself has a kingdom. So when Paul says principalities, he's talking about the highest form of demons. That means they are the ones ruling the other demons, the principalities. Then we come to the powers. The powers are the leaders of each territory. You see, they themselves have a hierarchy. They themselves have an army. And then the spiritual wickedness in high places is talking about the small kuti demons who go around doing work for the bigger ones, the, the, the principalities. Okay? And then we have the rulers of darkness in high places, talking about the humans uh, who are involved in witchcraft, satanic worship, and magic. So you see, they, he himself has a hierarchy, and he sends out his cohorts, and he sends out his demons to do this work. So he, uh, Paul is saying that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We should see the spirit that's behind what, what is happening in the world, the problems that you're facing. Amen? Hallelujah. Uh, so the attack... When you see the attack, he usually attacks the church. This church fighting with that church, this church members fighting with that church members. Huh? The attack is on the church, the attack is on the home, the attack is on the family, the attack is on the marriage, the attack is on the individual himself, okay, In herself or himself. And right now, we are facing an attack, a global attack. Our world is under attack by a ruthless enemy, a ruthless enemy. Huh? And um, this ruthless enemy, I think you all know who, what I'm talking about, is coronavirus. It's an invisible enemy. It is not of God. It is of the enemy. Okay? And it is the, it is the job of every Christian, every Christian and every church to unify and wage a war against this virus, this destructive evil until it is defeated. Hallelujah. This morning we were praying in the prayer room and you know, uh, Sister Victoria was saying that she feels as she was praying that the strain of that virus is coming less and less. Actually, if you see, people don't usually, unless it's some other, uh, you know, some other morbidities they have, other than that, uh, they usually don't die. That means the strain is becoming weaker, if you see. Huh? So, very soon, 
it will be wiped off. Hallelujah. Huh? So though he's a powerful destroyer, like I said, the, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Though he's a destroyer, huh? but we are not powerless against him or his devices. Hallelujah. You know why? Because God has given every believer an arsenal of weapons. An arsenal of weapons for the spiritual battle that we face today. Hallelujah. It's found in, I already spoke to you the last time, a few Sundays ago, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, you know, for, for, the, for the wages of uh, warfare, uh, I, I mean for the, the uh, sorry, sorry, I just got a bit, uh, yeah. In 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 and 4, you look up, you can see, and also it talks about in Ephesians chapter 6 about the whole armor and the fully dressed and ready for spiritual battle. Without the full armor of God, we cannot withstand the evil days. Can I have the slide, please? Slide number one. And so this morning, I want to speak to you on the secret weapon, the spiritual warfare that we are going to use. It's the Holy Spirit, the secret weapon of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Um, Second Corinthians, if you have Second Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, it says for the weapons of our warfare, the weapons that God has given us are spiritual weapons. They are mighty in God because God has given us those weapons so they are mighty in God through the pulling down of strongholds. Every kind of yoke bondage can be pulled down and destroyed with the spiritual weapon only. So you fight a spiritual battle with spiritual weapon, not with a physical weapon like, uh, you know, like guns or, or spears or whatever, swords or knives. You don't fight the wep uh, battle with that. You fight the battle with the, be with the weapons that God has given us. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Th that's the title of my message this morning. Our secret weapon to a breakthrough. We're going to see how the secret weapon of the Holy Spirit can help us to have a breakthrough. Hallelujah. Let's just look to the Lord in prayer this morning. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you and we praise you, Lord, even for your word to our hearts. We thank you for the worship, Lord, because you dwell in the praises of your people. You, you inhabit the praises of your people. We thank you for your presence here with us, Lord. Father, now even as we go into your word, Father, we pray that we will be not only hearers of your word, but we will be doers of your word. Father, help us to recognize what you have to speak to us through your Holy Spirit, Father God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that the words of my mouth will not be the wisdom of man, not be the wisdom of man, but it will come in the demonstration of your Holy Spirit, Father God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We thank you. We praise you for your word to our hearts this morning. Yes, Lord, help us to have listening ears to hear what the Spirit has to speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, so here, I, I was saying this morning, I was saying that, I was saying that the secret weapon, the secret weapon of the Holy Spirit, why is it called secret? Can I have slide number two, please? You see that the armor of God we put on the armor of God not, not when, we, uh, you know, when we are in trouble. We put it on all the time. In the armor of God, uh, we see here, the sick, why, why did, why, why did uh, uh, Paul say that it is a hidden weapon? Because if you look at the armor of God, it's, everything is there. You see the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, uh, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit, and, uh, and feet protected by the gospel. So everything is there. You see, when, when, when um, Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, he was already in jail. And he was in prison. And he was in chains, actually. Paul was in chains. And who was guarding him? The Roman soldiers were guarding him. Day and night he was guarded by the Roman soldiers. So you see how Paul got the revelation. When he looked at the Roman soldier, the Spirit of God gave him a revelation. This is the spiritual armor that God's people, the believers must use in the battle. Hallelujah. You see how fantastic this is. You see, so if you look at the armor, the spiritual armor, the armor of God is actually Jesus himself. 
It's Jesus himself. Okay, let me explain. The helmet of salvation. There's no other name under which man may be saved except through the name of Jesus. That salvation helmet. Then we come to the breastplate of righteousness. We stand in his righteousness. There's nothing good about us. We stand in his righteousness. That's the breastplate. And then we have the belt of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody goes to the Father except through me. The belt of truth. Then we have the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God, which I did the last, the first time. That is the rhema word of God, which can defeat the enemy. And that's how Jesus defeated the enemy at the, at the, uh, in the wilderness. Then we have the shield of faith, which is also Jesus. It is by grace that you're saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ again. And then feet shot with the shoes of peace. Jesus said, I am your peace. Huh? And the gospel. Okay. Now you see that's the whole of Jesus Christ. The whole, the whole armor is actually Jesus. And now where does the secret weapon come in? The secret weapon is the Holy Spirit. Because there's, you see, he has not given us any battle gear there. Paul ha hasn't given any battle gear for the Holy Spirit. That's why it is called a secret weapon. Moreover, the secret weapon is um, something that de the devil doesn't know about. He doesn't know about the Holy Spirit. And he doesn't know when we pray in the spirit, when we pray in tongues, he cannot understand. It's our secret weapon against him. There, and in this weapon, there's no defense against it. He has, he has no defense against this weapon. That's why it is called secret weapon. And it is very mighty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when the enemy comes in like a flood, one problem after another, one trial after another, one, uh, you know, uh, 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 thing after another coming into your family life. When the enemy comes in like the flood, the word of God says, the spirit of God raises up a standard. Hallelujah. The spirit of God raises up a standard. Hallelujah. Hmm? So there's no defense for this type of weapon. That's why it is called a secret weapon. That's why it's called, see, and it is hidden from the devil. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know? Okay. Um, I want you to just see the text this morning. I'm coming to my text this morning. Uh, ex the first slide. Uh, uh, Isaiah tw 10 and 27. Isaiah 10, 27. Okay. Thank you. This is my text for this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can turn or you can see the screen, but this is very important. It says here, and that's what I'm going to preach on, the anointing. The anointing is what's going to break the yoke. The anointing is what is going to give you a breakthrough. Because the anointing is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It is the secret weapon that can break the yoke. The word of God says. So Isaiah 10, 27. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off his shoulder and his yoke from his neck and the yoke shall be destroyed and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Okay, here. Let's look at what the meaning of this is. We, we come to the anointing. Huh? Okay. You, you will ask me, what then is the anointing? What is the anointing? The anointing is nothing but the enabling power of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in your life and my life. Hallelujah. Huh? It says that the Holy Spirit abides in you forever. Hallelujah. It's not today, it is there, and tomorrow it is gone. No, it is there forever, according to 1 John 2 and 27. Okay, hear, hear out what the meaning of anointing is. Because you might get confused uh, about, about the experience of the Holy Spirit. I just want to, slide three, please. Is that the one? Yeah, okay. See, uh, here. The anointing is talking about two distinct experiences in the Holy Spirit. There are two distinct experiences in the Holy Spirit. 
what are the two distinct experiences? One is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the other one is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That's why people are get, they get confused. Why should we be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Okay, let me explain to you. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit means when you receive Jesus as your personal Savior, when you first receive Jesus and say, yes, Lord, I want you to be the Lord of my life, what happens is the Spirit of God comes and indwells in you. Indwells in you, okay? And then he becomes resident. And not just resident, no. He becomes a permanent resident, PR. Huh? He becomes a PR in your life. Hallelujah. That is the first experience. Without salvation, you cannot have uh, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The second experience is the infilling. The infilling of the Holy Spirit is when the Holy Spirit gets hold of you. In the, uh, with the, you know, when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in, in tongues, that is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So you don't get confused. And now what happens is with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues, okay? The first time it is you receive Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes. He indwells in you. He takes care of your difficulties. You can ask him anything and he will take care of your difficulties. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues, what happens is he take, gets hold of you. First you get hold of him. Now he gets hold of you. Hallelujah, like that. Huh? So he becomes president, not just resident, he becomes president when you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's why the baptism of the Holy Spirit is so important. That's why Jesus told his disciples, you see, Jesus tells his disciples, after the resurrection, after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus met up with the disciples, he was with the disciples. After his res resurrection, he had a resurrected body. Jesus had a resurrected body and he was 40 days with his disciples. Before he left, he breathed into them the breath of life, the breath of the spirit. And he said, receive ye the spirit. So they became born again. Jesus breathed into them. Huh? That is that salvation. Then Jesus told them, wait in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of my father. Understand? So that was after Jesus. Jesus said, after I leave, then only the comforter can come. Comforter meaning the Holy Spirit. So I must leave first. If not, the comforter cannot come. So when Jesus left, ascended into heaven, the, the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples 10 days after. That was called the day of Pentecost. Pentecost means 50. So 40 days Jesus was with them. Then Jesus told them, stay in Jerusalem, don't go anywhere. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Uh, and he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 and verse and verse 8. If you look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, that is the promise of the Father. And uh, Jesus says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, and you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Huh? Because the disciples saying, now Lord, you're going away. What's going to happen to us? Jesus said, I will send you the comforter. I will send you the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will have what? Power. Jesus didn't tell them that you will have a plan. I have a plan. After I leave, he didn't give them a plan. He said he will give them what? Power. He didn't give them a plan for a succession plan, how to run the church, how to have a New Testament church, how to build the church. He didn't give them a plan. He gave them power. Hallelujah. That's what he said. When I go up, you will receive power from on high. Hallelujah. Hmm? That's called Pentecost. That's the power of Pentecost. Can I have slide four, please? That was the promise of the Father. It's the promise of the Father, okay? And this was prophesied long time ago in Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. Yeah, it says that it shall come to pass that on the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and all um, maidens and um, uh, daughters. Your daughters and maidens will prophesy and your young men will uh, have visions and your old men will have dreams. Okay, that is the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father is nothing but the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. That's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Okay, here I want you to know that power doesn't mean only power. It also means power and authority of the Holy Spirit that's going to come and live inside you when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's the, the, the word power actually means dunamis in Greek, and it means power and authority. 
Jesus Until the day of Pentecost, the 50th day came. And now if you look at your Bible, I think I didn't put it up there. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. This is talking about the day of Pentecost when what happened, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, when they baptized all the 120 believers that were in the upper room. Okay, I'll just read it to you. Acts 2 and verse 4. If you're writing down notes, just jot down somewhere. So, because this is so important for you to be baptized. If you want to walk in the power of the, uh, and, the, and the authority of Jesus Christ, you have to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So that's so, why it's so important. And that's why that secret weapon is so important, the weapon of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, And they were all filled as they were waiting upon the Lord. On the 50th day, there came a rushing, a mighty rushing of a wind. And the whole place was shaken and it was, uh, there, there was such a big noise. Huh? And cloven tongues like fire sat on the uh, believers, on, on, on the believers, okay? On, upon each one of them. And the word says here, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Hallelujah, glory to God. So how do I know that you're baptized in the Holy Spirit? When you are, with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. That's how I know that you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's very clearly it's written in the scriptures. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And Jesus says even in John 7, 32, whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water. Talking of rivers of living water is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Will flow from within them. So that, from that day, on the 50th day of Pentecost, the church was birthed. Hallelujah. That was the time the church was birthed. The Holy Spirit filled the first followers of Jesus Christ. And the power of the Holy Spirit came, up the, came upon them and transformed them into dynamic disciples. Hallelujah. Dynamic. There was such a difference when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. That's why Jesus said, I'm giving you the power. I'm not, I don't have any plan for you what to do about my church, but I'm giving you the power. Hallelujah, glory to God. And the next question here in the, in the slide is, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit still for today? Many people say that, no, like that, that the, the Holy Spirit baptism is only for those days, Jesus' time and all that. But it's very clearly written. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts 2, 38 and 39. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all those God calls. Are you called by God? Then you have to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is a promise from the Father. And it's a free gift. Hallelujah. Huh? So what is the importance of the anointing? Why do you need the anointing? Why do you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Jesus gives the answer. Look up at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. What is the importance? Luke chapter 4. Jesus gives us the answer why the anointing is important. Why the baptism of the Holy Spirit is important. Okay, because he, I will read to you. The Spirit of Jesus on that, um, on that day, on the Sabbath day, in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18 and 19, Jesus comes to preach in, in the synagogue. He opens up the scriptures to Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 1, and he says, and he speaks to the people, and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. God the Father himself had anointed Jesus to, 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 to do the works of God, okay? So the anointing, in other words, is for us also at this time, God has given us the Holy Spirit. The anointing is to preach, to heal, and to give freedom to the, and to proclaim freedom to the captives. This anointing cannot be bought. 
You see, you look at the uh, book of Acts in the chap on, uh, chapter 8. In chapter 8, Simon, a sorcerer, a magician, he saw the disciples all performing so many miracles. And he said he wants to buy that anointing. And P Paul told him, let your money die with you. You cannot buy the anointing. The anointing must come from God. So he gave his slam to the Lord, you know, Simon, the sorcerer or the magician. So it can't be earned. It can't be bought. It doesn't come and go. It remains with you. It abides with you forever. The anointing r remains with you forever. Remember this thing. Anointing is for every believer. Once you have received Jesus as your personal savior, the spirit of God comes into your life. And once you ask God and you ask Jesus, Jesus, by the way, is the baptizer of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus who's baptizing. Ask him desire for the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in the in spirit, in the, uh, speaking in the language of the Holy Spirit. And he will give it to you. Hallelujah. Then you see the power that God works within you. And it's also free. It's a gift from God. You, you cannot buy it. It's a gift from God. And remember that the anointing is always given for a purpose to every believer. Not simply for you to, you know, take the cloak and throw at somebody and, and you, know, you know, and think the anointing can do uh, marvelous things. But, you know, the anointing is given for a purpose and for every believer. And by the way, the anointing flows from whom? From the head. Who is the head of the church? From Jesus. So the anointing, he himself is the anointed one. The, uh, the anointing flows from Jesus to the church. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Huh? And it, the anointing also lifts the burdens from your shoulder. The anointing heals the sick. It abides in us and teaches us all things. Okay. Coming to the next slide. Next one. Uh, see, this is one way you can remember power. You see, how does the power function in my life? How does this power, if you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit and, and, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit is within you, I told you already at salvation, you already have the anointing, but baptism of the, uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit is to do the works of God. Okay? So how does this power function in my life? Very easy. Just remember four things. Power P-O-W-E-R. So you can, uh, you can remember that way. So how does it function in your life? How do I know that, you know, when I'm, I'm praying in the tongues, what, what can happen? First thing, P for prayer. You will pray effectively and with authority. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Romans 8 and 26 says that when you pray, sometimes you do not know what to pray for. But when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit prays through you. Because the Holy Spirit is the only one who knows the mind of God. And he will pray the will of God in your life and for your situation. Hallelujah, glory. That's why praying in the spirit is so powerful. Because the, the, the enemy, that's why it's called a secret weapon. The enemy doesn't know when you're praying in the spirit, you're praying, the Bible says you're praying mysteries to God. And you're praying in the spirit. So he doesn't know what you're praying actually. Hallelujah. The more you pray in the spirit, the more you will know the heart of God and the will of God. Hallelujah. Hmm? So here praying in the spirit uh, praying in the Spirit is so important. Praying in the Spirit is so important because it frustrates the enemy. The devil doesn't know what you're speaking. You yourself doesn't know. But the Spirit of God knows and he prays in your situation through the will of God. Hallelujah. That's the will of God. And then what else does the praying in tongues do? Praying in tongues edifies us, makes us, um, builds up our faith according to Jude, Jude uh, chapter 2. Jude chapter 2. Sorry, Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter in Jude. Jude chapter 1 and verse 20. I must get my uh, verses correct. Okay? Jude chapter 1 and verse 20 says, It edifies, praying in the spirit edifies or builds the faith. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18 also, Paul says that praying in the spirit, praying with supplication in the spirit, he says, that is also an armor. It's also a battle gear to, to, to uh, break the enemy forces and to bring down strongholds. It's also a weapon that God has given us. Hallelujah. So it's, it's, it also builds a wall of defense against the enemy. Like I told you, the devil will not know what, what, what you're praying when you're praying in the spirit. Huh? He doesn't know the mind of God 
only the Spirit of God knows the mind of God and he'll pray exactly the same. Okay, amen, hallelujah. Okay, now I'm coming to the next one, next point. P, we fin P is pray. Second is overcome. So this, the anointing that is within you, the anointing is within you is in my text this morning. And it shall come to pass in that day, Isaiah 10, 27, that his burden shall be taken away from off the shoulder and his yoke from off the neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Okay, number two is overcome. You can overcome with this anointing that is within you. You can overcome every bondage. God has given you the power to overcome every bondage, every yoke, every kind of uh, 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 difficulty uh, and destroying the powers of darkness. Hallelujah. And strongholds. Okay, that's the secret weapon. The anointing is able to do all this. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The anointing breaks the yoke. Uh, that's what um, the title of the message was that. The secret weapon, the Holy Spirit, huh, is the anointing that will break the yoke. Yoke means what? What is the yoke? You know, a yoke actually, the natural, in the natural sense, a yoke means, you know, the kind of a wooden device they put on the shoulder of um, oxen or horse so that they will plow the land together. They'll go together, together, the two oxen or two horses, they'll put a, a device here as a yoke so that they will plow the land properly. Okay, so here the yoke means it's a burden, isn't it? That, 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 that uh, in the natural, that wooden device is a burden for them. In spiritually speaking, it is a burden or a bondage that you carry for a long time, spiritually speaking. So the anointing will break the yoke means it can break any bondages and any difficulty and any burden that you're carrying. For example, addiction that you can't get over. It's like a stronghold, uh, a burden. Or unforgiveness, you can't, can't forgive someone. The anointing of God is able to break, break, hallelujah, break this, this bondage, whatever it may be, this yoke. And the anointing will break and destroy, not only just break, it will destroy the yoke, hallelujah, I like that, it will destroy the yoke. Some sickness that you've been having for a long time and you want to get rid of it, and, you know, the anointing is the one that will break and destroy the yoke. Hallelujah. Addiction, final, uh, fi financial crisis, envy or jealousy, uh, bitterness, all these things. All these things are addictions which you can get over it through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The, and it, because the word of God says that it is the anointing that destroys the yoke. Okay. Let me just take a break here. And let me just tell you um, my testimony. Just two days ago, I was supposed to bring the word of God. Okay? So I already knew what I was going to speak because I knew I, I, I covered all the weapons already. I did the word of God. Then we did the name of Jesus, blood of Jesus, uh, you know, all the weapons we did. And, and uh, this is the final weapon that I wanted to do. So I, I had in my mind already that I'm going to speak on the weapon of the Holy Spirit, which is the last weapon. So, but the thing is, I started uh, somewhere around Thursday or like that, I started preparing the message. Friday, just two days ago, Friday I was in the clinic, and as I was in the clinic, um, suddenly, you know, I was fine. It's Friday morning, all, I, I went to do my car servicing, you know, and, and then I uh, did a few things. I was fine. I was just fine. Ate well and all that. Friday evening in the clinic, suddenly I had cold chills and rigors. So cold that I had to off all the aircon and everything, but I was so cold and my whole body was aching. Very painful. And I was just thinking, how am I going to drive back home? I just prayed and said, God, you just got to help me. You know, I told the girl I'm going off a, a little early. Uh, thank God all the patients came before nine. And I just finished and I was feeling so sick. I came home. Uh, uh, before I came home, I checked my temperature. I used all the different thermometers. And the amazing thing is that my temperature was normal. 36.6, 36.5, you know, normal temperature. So I came home, but I was still shivering and I was feeling so sick, I didn't feel like eating. I just told my mate to get two slices of toasted bread and that was what I ate for, for dinner. 
and I was just so sick, I didn't do anything. Then I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm going to bring the word, the anointing that's going to break the yoke. Father, I just prayed this prayer, you know. Father, help me to, uh, you know, uh, this, this anointing that's going to break the yoke, let it work in me, Father God. Let your anointing break the yoke of fever in the name of Jesus. And I went to sleep. I thought that in the middle of the night, I'll surely get up because the fever will come up again. But you know what? The night itself, God worked. And next morning, I, I got up only at 9 o'clock. I didn't even know I had a fever. <laughs> I did my, my whole body was so good, you know, and felt so fresh. I knew it was a spiritual attack. The devil didn't want his people to know about the secret weapon. This, this, that's why, you know, he brought this thing on me. Do I look sick? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. So the, the fever went off just like that. You see, it was a spiritual attack. So what I'm trying to say is the anointing can break any yoke, any bondage in your life. If you just pray in the spirit and if you just, uh, you know, uh, pr pray the word of God, and the word, uh, and, and pray in the spirit all the time. So the third thing is witness. Why do you have this anointing within you? How does it function? First, it helps you to pray effectively. Second, it helps you to overcome addiction, overcome bondages, overcome yokes in your life. Third thing is it helps you to witness. The first thing Jesus said to them in Acts chapter 1 and 8 is that, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses correct that's the first thing the, the the you know the main function of the anointing and you shall be my witnesses because why people like peter and all were so scared you know the, peter denied jesus isn't it and they were all so worried jesus, now jesus also leaving them jesus going up to heaven what's going to happen the roman soldiers are going to come to us and they're going to persecute us that's why jesus said i will give you the power hallelujah uh, you shall receive power to witness for Jesus. And then you see how when the baptism in the Holy Spirit gave them the power to witness boldly. Uh, they spoke boldly. You see, the first miracle that took place, I think I shared with you the last time the name of Jesus, the, the cripple at the gate beautiful. Hmm? That was the first miracle that took place after Jesus was not with them. But because they were baptized in the Holy Spirit with the power, they went and prayed to, uh, f uh, to the uh, to crippled man who was crippled from birth. And he uh, started to walk, okay? That was the first miracle. And then, w uh, while the miracle was going on, okay, when the miracle was, and this man was so excited and he was jumping everywhere and, and giving glory to God and, you know, all this, the people, the, the, the Sadducees and Pharisees were so jealous, you know, they came and asked P uh, Peter and John, with what power you have been doing this? Under whose name you're doing this, this kind of, uh, you know, they thought it's some magic, huh? And they boldly, the word of God says, very boldly, look at them as witnesses. You'll see what a change, what the baptism of the Holy Spirit had done to them. What a change came upon their lives. What a transformation came upon their lives. You'll see that in Acts chapter, uh, chapter 4, yes, chapter 4 and verse, uh, verse 12 and 13. They, they gave the gospel. They said, you persecuted Jesus, you killed Jesus, uh, you, let us, uh, you let us murderer go free, all these things you did. See how boldly they spoke to the Sadducees and Pharisees. They're all high people, you know. High, uh, all, uh, 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 I mean, they are, they are authorities actually. So for them to speak, for the Peter and John to speak against the authorities, don't you think it is the power of the Holy Spirit? It is the power of the Holy Spirit for them to speak up to the authorities, for them to say, uh, there's no, there's, there is salvation only in the name of Jesus. Huh? All these things you have been doing, but the salvation, Jesus can, only Jesus can give the salvation. And, and then they spoke, they gave the gospel, and they said about the, uh, the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, that how Jesus was with them, huh? even after he was resurrected. Then, Verse 13, Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, it says, Now when they, they talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all these rulers and these authorities, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated, correct, and untrained fellows, correct. They were fishermen only. That's all they were. They were. But when they spoke, 
the word in boldness after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When they spoke, 5,000 people were saved. Immediately they said yes to Jesus. These Pharisees and Sadducees, they, they, they saw this untrained man and they marveled why? Because they said that they had been with Jesus. They recognized that these people, though they were untrained, though they were, you know, uneducated, but because they were with Jesus, the anointing, they could see that. Huh? And so here, what you need to know is that anointing was given to them to be witnesses. So they boldly witnessed and they spoke, uh, spoke of Jesus' death and resurrection and that the salvation is only in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So the power of Pentecost on that day is the still here for t today for the church. The power to speak okay. with boldness the word of God. Hallelujah. To speak the, uh, to the word of God in boldness. We don't need to worry about, you know, who is going to say what. If the sp spirit of God is within you and you can speak, speak with boldness and speak and, and have... Uh, and speak the word of God. Amen. Okay, the four. P, finish, O, W, E. E stands for edify. Huh? It edifies you. When you pray in the spirit, it edifies you. It builds your faith. Hallelujah. Jude 1 and 20, I just told you just now. Okay, and the last R. R is what? Releasing. R stands for release. You're releasing the anointing to work miracles for Jesus. You see the miracles after that, one by one, how many miracles took place? In the New Testament church, I'm coming to that. When Jesus had gathered his disciples together, he gave them this parting promise and commission. Jesus said what, you know, to them. He said, you will do the things that I do. When the power comes upon you, you will do the things that I do. And what, Samo? And greater, yes, and greater things than this you will do, Jesus told them. So, you know, you'll be surprised. How come I can do greater things than Jesus? But Jesus knew what he was saying when he said that. Let me give you the verse. John 14, 12, if you're writing now. John 14, 12. Jesus said, you'll do the things that I do, and you'll do greater things. Then you'll think, how can I can do greater things than Jesus? But you know what Jesus meant? Jesus meant that when he came to earth as a physical man, as a 100% man and 100% God, but he, had, he wanted to be limited to the Son of Man. That means he could do all his miracles around Israel only. He cannot be in Israel at the same time. He cannot be in U.S. He cannot be in Africa. He cannot be in other places. He's limited. But Jesus said, but when I go, the comforter will come. The spirit of Christ will come and dwell in you. Then you can be everywhere. Hallelujah. You can be the whole world. That's why Jesus said, you will do greater things than me. You will do, you will do the miracles in Africa. You will do the miracles in all the places. Because the Spirit of God is everywhere. The Spirit of Jesus Christ dwells in you. That's what he meant. Do you understand? Wonderful. Hallelujah. And Jesus also said that these signs will follow those who believe. And you better believe and be baptized in the Holy Spirit. These signs will follow. They will drive out demons. Huh? Mark 16, 17 and 18. Mark, Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. They will drive out demons. You don't need to wait for the pastor to drive out demons. You can do it. If you have the anointing of God, if you have salvation, and you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you can deliver people out of demons. They will speak in new tongues. You see the word says, Jesus, Jesus is speaking this. Huh? They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes, and it will not hurt them. They will place their hands on the sick, and the sick will recover. Jesus is saying this to us. This is the commission he's given us. All these things will follow them that believe. If you believe in the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all these things will follow. Hallelujah. Can I hear a loud amen? Don't seem to be excited. He's given us so much. It's a gift from God. Hallelujah. And also with that, what in addition, in the bonus, what did God give us? He gave us the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit. The spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit, nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, God gave us. They are supernatural weapons. I cannot go into detail about them. If you want to know in detail about the spiritual gifts, join my discipleship class next year. <laughs> okay, this that made me happy, uh, laugh. Uh, that on all, it will take a few, few more lessons and a lot. So God also gave us supernatural weapons 
through the spiritual giftings of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. You have the vocal gifts. You have the revelation gifts. You know, the disciples started moving in these gifts. They were all given. Once you are a believer, don't say you don't have a gift. You have a gift. The Bible says every believer has a gift. Every believer has a gift. Hallelujah. You can have more than one gift. Okay? So here, <clears throat> here what, you, what you need to know is that the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit is for you to use in the kingdom of God to edify one another. Okay? Vocal gifts, revelational gifts, uh, and um, power gifts, the gift of faith, the gift of miracles, it's all there. You only have to ask. Ask and it will be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Okay? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Ask and it will be given unto you. Huh? It doesn't matter uh, whether, I, whether you went to Bible school or Bible college or whatever. It doesn't matter. When God anoints you, you will have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And from there on, God can bless you. Hallelujah. Okay, I'm going to close with this. Slide six, please. Slide six, yeah. I just want to bring up some of the anointed examples of anointed people in the church. Uh, sorry, in the Bible. Biblical examples of anointed people in the Bible, okay? I just can take one or two examples only. The first example in the Old Testament is David. David. David was on, anointed as king of Israel at a very small age, very young age. You know why? Because he loved God. He loved to worship. And when God saw him just worshipping, God always inhabits the praises of his people. The presence of God came down upon him. So when King Saul, at that time King Saul was uh, king, when King Saul was disturbed in the night, he cannot sleep, he had insomnia, he had bad dreams, evil thoughts. You know who he called? He called David. He called David, come and play some music. And when David worshipped, the evil spirits left. They left. There and then they left. King Saul knew that there was something about this small boy. And so he was anointed. Not any of his brothers, but he was anointed as king, the next king of Israel. And then what, what happened? When it came to, you all know the story of David and Goliath, right? He had to face Goliath, the big, huge Philistine, the giant. He had to face him. And what did he do? King Saul said, oh, you want to go and fight? Uh? Okay, you go and fight, but I better give you the armor. Take my armor. He gave him carnal weapons. King Saul gave him carnal weapons. He gave him the armor. He gave him the sword. He gave him the shield. And the, small, the little fellow put on the armor. He put on the shield. He put on the helmet. He said, ah, oh, this is too heavy for me. I don't need it. He took it all away and threw it away. And he said, Give me a sling. I will go in the name of the Lord. He will go in the name of the Lord and with a slingshot. And what, you know the end of the story. He's, he he, he uh, um, looked at the Philistine, the giant, and said, you come to me with a sword and a spear and everything, but I come to you in the name of the Lord and with this sling. And he, with the sling, he shot him and one shot, the giant fell down. And he went and cut off his head. And that was the, 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 actually that was the outward result, the cutting of the head. But the real unseen secret weapon was what? The anointing and the name of the Lord. The anointing and the name of the Lord was what did, uh, uh, what made uh, the giant fall down. Goliath fall down. It was the anointing and the name. Hallelujah. So you see the anointing upon David. Then we see the anointing upon Jesus. The second example, the anointing upon Jesus, Luke 3, 4. Luke 3, 4. Okay? Jesus was anointed. Jesus himself was anointed by the Holy Spirit at baptism in the river Jordan. Do you know that? Jesus himself was baptized. The heavens opened. Who baptized him? The Father baptized him. Heavens opened and, and the Spirit, Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. After that, only his ministry took, took a head. You can, you can go back and check. He first thing what? He fought the uh, devil in the wilderness. The spirit led him first to the wilderness because now he was full of the spirit. Jesus was full of the spirit. He could fight against 
against the devil in the wilderness. Okay. So Jesus himself was anointed. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Okay, and from that time onwards, all his ministry just took off. Okay, then the third, the third example, and with that, we, we go to the keys. The third example is the anointing in the New Testament church, in the New Testament. As soon as they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, the first miracle they did was what I shared the last time, the miracle of the cripple. Hmm? For years, he was born uh, uh, lame. He was, they just said, we don't have any silver or gold to give you. But in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. But what did they have? Peter and John, what did they have? They had the anointing. So in the, uh, with the anointing, in the name of Jesus, they spoke and the man got up and started to walk. Hallelujah. So I'm just going to give you roughly what are the miracles and signs and wonders following the ministries of Paul, Peter, John, uh, and the others. All the miracles that took place. Huh? Why? After they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay, just a few, this thing. Peter, healing the lame man. If you are writing notes, you can write down quickly. Peter, healing of the lame man. You can find all this in the book of Acts. That's why it's called the Acts of the Apostles. Acts 3, 6 to 8, he then healed, healed many. The Bible says in Acts 5. Then he healed Aeneas. Then he healed, uh, he raised Dorcas from the dead. Dorcas was a widow lady who was doing so good for people. And suddenly when she died, everybody couldn't take it. They all came to Peter and said, Peter, do something. Can you, can you just uh, pray for this lady? Peter put everybody out of the house and, uh, and, raised, and, and prayed for Dorcas and she rose up from the dead. The widow, Dorcas. Okay? Paul. What, did, what are the things that Paul did? So many, but I'm just giving you a few. The blinding of Elimias, the healing of the cripple, the miracles of Ephesus, the miracles at Malta. You know the wiper? A deadly wiper. If you... If, if it just bites you, within a few seconds you die. But it, he didn't die. So the natives, when they saw, they said, this man's God must be the real God. So there again, it was a witness. The miracle became a witness. And, they be, and their salvation came to that place, okay? To, that, to Malta. Then he also, um, the slave girl, he also had the spirit of discernment. You see, the spiritual gift was, uh, was working in, in Paul. You see, this, this slave girl was used by her master to go and uh, prophesy, uh, to read palms from people, okay? And, uh, and Paul recognized that it was the evil spirit. How he recognized? Spirit of discernment, which is one of the spiritual gifts, one of the supernatural gifts, okay? And then he set her free. Okay, so many other, uh, other miracles in, 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 um, in, the, in the book of Acts. You can read about the apostles after they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Please go back and read the book of Acts. You can read it again and again and again, and your faith will be built by the, just by that. Then why don't we see these miracles taking place now? Why we cannot find this kind of miracles all happening in the church? Why, you know? Because you need the key to release the anointing. One of the main keys is faith. Don't know if I pray for this person, whether he's going to walk or not. Huh? And no faith. Huh? So one of the main things is faith. So uh, uh, keys to releasing the anointing. Yeah, okay. Faith. You need to have the keys. If not, you cannot say, I got the anointing, I just go and pray. You must have faith. Lah. You see, that's why when Jesus healed people, when Jesus healed the woman with the issue of blood, uh, healed uh, so many other people in the, in the Bible, when Jesus healed, he said, your faith has brought you the miracle. Your faith has healed you. It must be faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Huh? Even, in the, even the cripple at the beautiful gate, what did Peter and John say? Look at us. Have faith in the, in the name of Jesus. Look at us. We are followers of Jesus. So without faith, he, they couldn't do the miracle. They couldn't get the crippled man to walk. If he didn't, if the cripple didn't have faith, they couldn't. So he, he needed faith. Okay. Second key. All the keys you know already. Because you need to have praying in the spirit as a second key. Okay? Praying the word of God. Release the word of God. In your circumstances, it's, a, it's, it's also a key. Okay? All this and worship. You see, just now when we worship God, he inhabits the praises of people. In the worship itself, things can happen. Yokes can be broken. Bondages can be broken. Hallelujah. Because God's, when God's presence is there, there will, the anointing will have to break the yoke. Will have to break the bondage. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And with this, I close. I just want to tell you a little bit more. The Acts of the Apostles 
the Acts of the Apostles, the book of Acts, huh? it is not actually the Acts of the Apostles. It is the Acts of God. It is actually the Acts of God because all these are supernatural Acts. How can man do? Cannot, isn't it? Supernatural ability given to them through the Holy Spirit. So actually, X is not the X of the apostles. It is the X of God, the supernatural X of God, through the apostles, through the X of the apostles. So what was the X, what were the apostles doing for, in order for God to move? Three things. The last, the last, that's the last slide, okay? Three things they did. They preached the word. Number two, they praised God, like I said, worship. They praised God. They were always coming together and praising and praying. And they prayed. Three things, three Ps to remember. If you want to see God moving, the supernatural acts of God, they are the supernatural acts of God. It's not the acts of the apostles. The book of Acts is their acting and their acts that they did through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the supernatural ability given to them through the Spirit. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just rise up to our feet. Can I have the musicians, please? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father, wonderful Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's not take any glory for ourselves. You know, when we go and we it's pray for someone, someone think it's because we prayed. It's nothing to do with that. The anointing, huh? This, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7 says that we have this treasure in us. In this earthen wealth, we have a treasure. The treasure is what? The priceless anointing. The priceless anointing. Hallelujah. Hmm? That the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So we don't take any glory. It's nothing about us. The power that is there is God's power being used as you release it in faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just rise up to our feet. And if Jesus said that if any man thirsts, let him come to drink. If you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you can always ask God for it. You can always desire. Hallelujah. You can always desire for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, nobody prayed for me for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I did it myself. I read the scriptures and I knew I wanted what I wanted. I wanted the full power of the Holy Spirit in me. So I was baptized on my own in my own bedroom. Nobody baptized me. So if you have the desire for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you can desire for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Ask Jesus. He's the baptizer. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. Hallelujah.
Amen. Amen. 